Cool. All right, so I'll get started uh, quickly. So there, there's sort of two things today. Um, the first part, officially this was going to be about wireless networking. Uh, I changed it a little. I'll just be talking, rather than giving a quick overview of some protocols that you've already used, I'll talk a little bit about USB, which is something you might not have used. Um, the caveat here, this second half isn't directly useful to the robot you're building. Uh, so if you don't want to stay for it, I won't be upset, don't worry. Uh, I know you're all busy. But before that, the important part is a bunch of uh, some newer competition rules have been updated. There's almost no changes. Uh, just as a note, Alex had mentioned that over the weekend, someone or some group was eating or drinking in the room. Uh, just as a reminder that he will probably, if that continues, he'll remove access after hours, so you can only come uh, during regular school hours. Uh, the rules have also been updated. If they catch you in the lab, you now lose one point off your um, competition mark, which is basically 1% off your final grade. So this was done because if you eat or drink in the lab, it affects the other students. Uh, so this way it affects you even worse. Uh, so that was one of the updates. The, the course dimensions are still very close to the original as planned. Um, the original image was too scale, by the way, if you didn't know that. So you could have used that to measure out things. I, I don't have updated dimensions. Basically, at this point, they've been building the course as close as possible to that original image. Uh, I, so if you really want specific dimensions, you can measure the physical course, but it should be very close. A few coins have changed locations or something like that. Uh, but, you know, just move four inches. Uh, all right, so the day of events. All this, by the way, was the same as was in the rules already at this point. So no, none of this has changed from what it was. I'm just sort of reiterating. Um, so the first match will be at 9.30, possibly a little before that. Uh, to make sure that happens on time, everyone, the Sexton Gym, uh, basically show up at 9 a.m. So the Sexton Gym's, where's it, that way, over there. Um, and you'll be told what the next <coughs> set of matches is. So you'll be told who's going to be on the course first, next, and ideally up to like the next five or something like that. Um, so that way you'll know like if you have to be getting ready or if you want to, you know, finish some stuff in your robot, uh, you know you've got a bit of time to do that. But you've got to be back when you're the next people on, this is the on deck, or you can forfeit the, uh, the round. Um, so it's two minutes on the course, and then in between, once the two minutes is over, there's one minute for everyone to clear. You know, if your robot, some stuff got knocked off it, you've gotta go clear that off the course. Um, and while people are doing that, you're getting your robot into the starting gates. Uh, the competition itself, to keep it within a reasonable time is being run as a double elimination style. So this was a slight change from the uh, original rules. And what happens is all the team names will just be randomly drawn. And uh, those two teams are going to compete. So, you know, it'll say team seven versus team 13. Um, and if, if team seven, say, is the winner, uh, they'll go on. If team 13 had previously lost the match, They've now lost twice, so they'll no longer be paired against anyone else, and that'll be sort of their final ranking. Does someone immediately go back into the pool, or do they get like, to the bottom? Uh, they play for well, there, there is. So basically what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to pull, because there's like five, there's going to be a certain amount that have predetermined matches. So it's going to say seven versus 13 is right now. Next up is six versus two. The next four are you know three versus one, whatever. So you couldn't. You could be after that's all done, but you'll have at least like four rounds or five rounds. Or it sort of depends once they get the final board up. Uh, but you'll have at least, you would never have to play right away because uh, there's always going to be a predetermined order, so to speak, uh, for the next like five just to get everything ready. Um, yeah, and then if at the end there's one team left who's the winner. Um, any questions on sort of the, that? Hopefully it seems very simple, but. Okay, uh, for triggering the rounds, this is the, the timer board. So Mark has these. On the competition day, we'll have 15-ish of them or 20 of them. Uh, I think if he gets them all built. Uh, so you'll have to make sure you have somewhere on your board that you can, this can be plugged in. And all it needs is there's a ground connection here. Uh, there's a five volt, so this will go to the, the five volt rail. And then there's this middle pin, the reset, which you'll connect to your, uh, your microcontroller reset pin. And what this will do is this will hold your uh, microcontroller in reset so it's not executing code. 
um, until it's triggered by, they basically have a very bright light that's pointing at each robot, um, and they trigger both lights at the same time. So both robots uh, will come out of reset at the exact same time, and then this chip will count two minutes, and after two minutes is up, it puts your robot back in reset, so it should uh, power down. So you'll, you'll want to make sure uh, that when your robot is, is in reset, it's not moving. Uh, the motor drivers will take care of that automatically if you haven't changed any of the pull-ups or pull-downs or anything. Uh, that will be the case. So, so yeah, you'll have to make sure you, you're able to connect this board into your, uh, into your system. And at the beginning of the competition, we'll have to move some of these boards around a little bit because there's not quite enough. Uh, for everyone, once we get about halfway through, we'll just keep them on the robots. Uh, if you want to test with the boards in, so on competition day, you wire it in, you want to check, basically all you need is, it's just a bright light, so if you have a phone, uh, flash will work, or I will try to have some flashlights around for testing, uh, but that's all it does, is it looks for a very, very bright light, you know, not, it can be set off by the ambient light or anything, uh, directed right at it, and starts your two minutes. So that's very basically how we're going to be triggering the rounds. Um, so as I said, yeah, you've got to ensure you have space. If you want to physically look at one, you can see Mark. You can see it's very small. There's just these three wires. They go into a breadboard and they can go anywhere type thing. So fairly straightforward. Um, yeah, and the lunch, normally the IEEE student branch <laughs> provides lunch. Uh, there's a barbecue on that day. I don't is anyone with the IEEE student branch here? That, do you know if that's for sure? Yeah, there's something. Okay, so I, I know it was planned. I didn't know if it was. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. So yeah, so there should be a little barbecue. Um, probably with you know, a bit of a break for lunch, or a slowdown for lunch. It should run until about 3.30 or 4 of the day. Um, so we're trying to keep it, in previous years they've run way into the night, so we're trying to keep it more reasonable. Um, but I think that's all the updates. Are there any questions at this point on the competition? Or other stuff, okay. Nothing, nothing. All right. Uh, so the second part of this lecture, I'm going to give this sort of very brief version, like 45 minute talk. Um, so this is a talk I'm giving next week on uh, introducing introduction of using USB. So this is if you ever wanted to uh, use USB to talk to your own device, how you might do that. And I'm going to be talking to it from Python. There's some other languages you can do instead. Um, but the idea is to sort of give you some thought. Uh, when it comes to, especially doing your, your senior year projects, um, you might uh, be interested in sort of, well, how can we get data from a computer to our, uh, to our system and stuff like that. So, so the title, the S part, is because Python, the joke is a snake, right? Always have to explain the jokes. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what the heck USB to is, and uh, you've probably heard of USB 3.0. That's so much more complicated for the very basic stuff we're doing, you don't really need to know about it. Um, but there's already a whole bunch of ways to interface to uh, these type of boards, or these type of uh, USB uh, connections. They've been around for quite a while. But one of the more interesting ones that I'll sort of talk to you about is using USB microcontrollers. So what this means is that you can actually uh, use, you know, you can make a device do entirely your own stuff. So you're not limited to what data you send, what it behaves like, uh, connected to your computer. Uh, and as part of that, I'll basically be talking about the support. So the USB drivers, uh, how you write a GUI on the computer really easily, uh, and some of the debugging and details of if, if, for example, you wanted to make a product out of this, what it would mean. Um, so this, this presentation itself was really quick, and this overview I'm going to be going even faster. So if you're interested, there will be a link somewhere. Oops. Um, these slides will be posted on BB Learn, but there'll be some example code posted there. It's not up yet. Um, but if you're interested in this, or you can talk to me. Uh, as a very sort of quick caveat, if you've used Python before, I'm doing some very, very basic Python code, so it's bad per se, it's, it's written quite poorly. Uh, I'm skipping over a lot of details of USB itself, 
Uh, it's a somewhat complicated standard, not excessively so, but there's quite a number of very good introductory resources, so I'm not going to repeat all of that details he here. Uh, and I'm also going to be misusing some of the design of USB to, to show you basically how to get a device, plug it into your computer, and send data. Um, so you've already seen in your robot how we can use that serial port to send data. Uh, but what we want to do is, you know, you were just looking at it on a screen. You'd have to write a whole back end to receive the data, uh, display it, or stuff like that. So we can actually simplify that a lot using USB uh, microcontrollers. So we can, you don't have these free ones. The, the actual demo will have some uh, examples, so we can skip that. Um, yeah, so this is part one. I warn you that uh, this overview will be very, very brief, so it puts you on the wrong side. If you haven't heard, heard of this uh, Dunning-Kruger curve, basically uh, there's a experiment that was done and it proves that as you get a tiny bit of experience, your confidence goes way up here. Uh, as you start to learn more, you sort of realize like, oh, actually I don't know anything. Um, so the introduction I'm going to be giving is going to just put you here, uh, when in reality you, know, you should be way, way down. So that's sort of the very the caveat I have to this introduction. Um, all right, so what the heck is USB? Uh, USB itself was basically this idea that, uh, you know, there was a time when if you bought a scanner, you bought a mouse, you had this, these different protocols, all these ports in the back of your computer, you could plug it in, uh, Windows would try to auto-detect it, it never worked or anything like that. Uh, so USB was this hope that, well, maybe we can make a universal... Uh, standard, it stands for Universal Serial Bus. You know, I can plug my microphone in, the computer detects it, downloads the drivers. It actually works pretty well. Uh, I'm always impressed with how well USB works, all things considering. Uh, and that's what makes it sort of a pretty interesting uh, standard to use. Uh, the documentation is entirely free, so some specs aren't that way. You have to pay like, you know, $1,000 to be part of the the implementers form or whatever they call it. In USB, anyone can download it, uh, and the specs are actually kind of reasonably written. This is also different from a lot of other specs, so this here I've pulled right from the USB spec. You know, it's like a, it's a paragraph, and you can read it, and it makes sense. Uh, if you read other specs, it's all just very detailed, like the USB device may only do this, blah, 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 blah. Uh, where that's sort of explaining how they came about with the whole idea, so. Um, that's one really good resource if you want some more backstory on USB. But to save you from that, the real USB uh, crash course I'll be giving is sort of in like three slides or four slides here. Uh, basically, USB has this idea that over here, we have a physical device. Um, so that's the, you know, the thing we plug into the computer. USB tries to make that physical device look like something to the computer. Uh, that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be constrained by that physical device. Uh, one of those is this idea of having an endpoint. So an endpoint is just basically a bucket that the computer can send or receive data to. Um, so somewhere down here we have you know, this endpoint and it just says you can send data here. Or all send data to, back to you. So if you had a microphone, this one endpoint could be you know, the audio stream coming back to the computer. Uh, if you have a USB flash drive, one stream is data going from the flash drive to the computer, one stream is from the computer to the flash drive. Uh, there's a special one called endpoint zero, uh, which is also known as the control endpoint. So there's this one uh, endpoint, this bucket of bits that is designed specifically for the computer to send configuration information to the device. So it you know, asks the device, hey, what type of device are you? What's your manufacturer? What's your serial number? Um, so this is all done over the control endpoint. So the control endpoint has very, very well-defined uh, protocols for writing to it because every device that you plug into your computer supports this control uh, endpoint and is able to you know, deal with what's my serial number, what's my manufacturer, what's my name, uh, and the computer will use that to identify the device. We'll take a bunch of those endpoints together and we'll put them into an interface. So an interface just encompasses a different number of endpoints and the amount varies on what the device is doing. So way in here in this diagram, you can probably barely see it, 
Um, you can see this, this collection of endpoints is an interface. Um, and the inter there can be multiple interfaces in a device. Most of the stuff we're talking about, we won't worry about that. Uh, but basically, the interface defines how the device can uh, be talked to from the computer. So is this a serial uh, USB to serial converter device? Is this a microphone device? Is it mass storage, which would be you know, a flash drive or something like that? Um, so, so far, we kind of just have buckets of bits. What we need to add on to that is what's known as the USB descriptors, which describe things. Um, so the descriptor basically says, what is this device specifically? Uh, so this includes what's known as a class. So that can be the mass storage class, for example, is uh, when you plug in a flash drive. Um, there's something called a vendor ID, which is a 16-bit number that is assigned to each device. And that allows you to uniquely identify who is the manufacturer of this ID. Um, if it has a serial number, it will tell you, you know, what is the serial number of the device. So your computer can read the device descriptor to understand what this physical device is that you just plugged into your computer. Um, you know, what physically, who made it, what's the serial number, it might pop up a manufacturer name, it might pop up a product name, um, firmware version, stuff like that. Uh, within that, we have a configuration descriptor that describes a specific configuration of the device. So USB has this idea that we might have one device that can have different configurations. Um, each configuration has a different interface to it. So you might have a webcam, for example, and you say we can just configure it as a microphone. So we just use the microphone on it. Uh, we have another configuration that does the streaming video and um, you know, the microphone for video audio, something like that. Uh, so your computer can look at it and say, what configuration do I want you to behave as? Uh, and this is where it describes, you know, well, if you use this configuration, we have an interface. Within that interface, you have data in, data out, stuff like that. Um, and the device descriptor will also reference what's known as string, string descriptors. Um, and these just tell it, you know, the device name, manufacturer, stuff that when you first plug in a device, uh, in the little corner, something will pop up often like, hey, you plugged in, you know, Acme Corporation's USB-powered anvil. Um, and that's being pulled over the string configurators, uh, the string descriptors, uh, which just tells the user about the device. Um, it then uses the, the stuff like the vendor ID and another descriptor, the product ID, to download drivers or, or tell you you need to find drivers somewhere. Um, so I mentioned here this idea of this class. So there's a whole bunch of classes. I won't go over all of them. Um, two of the sort of more interesting, if you want to play around with USB, are what's known as the human interface device, uh, which is USB's way of saying stuff like a mouse or a keyboard or a joystick is a human interface device. Um, the advantage of this, or the HID class, is that it never requires drivers from any operating system. So Windows or anything like that, you can plug a keyboard in. The basic keyboard functionality is built into the operating system. Um, this is very convenient because you don't need to deal with, you know, your user has to find drivers or stuff like that. Um, so that's the class I mostly talk about in this presentation. The other one, a mass storage class, for example, uh, can allow a, a USB key to work also without needing special drivers. So sometimes they're entirely built into the operating system. Uh, so this mass storage class is, you know, hard drive, stuff like that, USB connected hard drive. Um, you just plug it in and then a few seconds or a minute, depending on how fast your computer is working, uh, Windows will allow it to work. It doesn't need to download anything uh, to get that device working. There's, there's a few other, the other sort of class, there's something called a vendor specific class. Um, so you can also define your own uh, classes entirely. So you can say, I'm gonna use this device just to send raw data back and forth. Uh, there's classes like video, um, ethernet, so USB ethernet adapter have their own class. And uh, USB to serial converter. So if you've ever used a uh, USB to serial converter, which is what's on your, your programming board for your, um, Robots, it has that class in it. Um, another thing that you can use is what's known as a IAD. Um, so this is used 
basically, you might have a case where you say, hey, actually what I want is I want a keyboard with a built-in mass storage controller uh, because I'm gonna have you know, a keyboard with built-in storage and maybe a built-in webcam just to add a bunch of stuff. So you can um, cram together a whole bunch of classes into one device. Uh, what this example might look like is one of the classes CDC is the, the ser basically the USB to serial. So this is what, when you're using the printf, um, you can use this type of USB class to just send data to your screen um, as a serial, sort of like as if it's a serial port, which means you can just view it in that terminal emulator. So that's kind of nice. And you might want that to also be combined with you know, the mass storage class, um, and as I said before, the HID class, because maybe this is a keyboard-like device. Or you might want to combine uh, a mass storage class with something like your own proprietary high-speed interface. So you have a high-speed interface for doing data transfer, uh, but when the user first plugs it in, the device appears as if it's a USB key and you know, it has the drivers and documentation all ready for them. Uh, so there's lots of reasons you might need something like this. So I'm not gonna take you through it, but I'll just tell you it does exist. Um, so USB 2.0, it actually has a bunch of different speeds. And you'll see devices, sort of the scam used to be, when USB 2.0 first came out, USB 2.0 added this high speed mode. Um, high speed is 480 megabits per second, uh, which now is sort of too slow for a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff, so that's why USB 3.0 was such a big boost. But high speed mode at the time was 480 megabits per second, or it is still. Uh, at the time, that was really amazing. Uh, the previous versions of USB had USB full speed mode, uh, it was called, which is 12 megabits per second, which was at the time quite common for almost everything, and it's still fairly common if you don't need very high speed data transfer. Um, the trick at the time was that devices would sell themselves as USB 2.0, which people assumed meant high speed, but really it was USB 2.0 full speed, um, which it was. It, it was compliant to this specification, but they were sort of trying to mislead you. Um, so when you say USB 2.0, you could mean any of these three speeds. There's also a low speed mode, which isn't as common, um, but it, stuff like mice and keyboard often use it because they don't need uh, very high speed. It has some advantages in um, that you don't need a detachable cable. Uh, the power consumption can be a little better. There's some reasons they do use that low speed mode, uh, but most stuff, if you're just sort of playing around, is almost guaranteed to be the, the full speed mode. And you can get up to high speed if you, you, know, you want to do real data transfer from a device. Um, so to determine, because you could plug in a device and it can be any speed, so it, the, the computer needs to know, uh, just as a note, there's sort of, when you look at a USB de design, you'll often see resistors on the data line. So if you look at the schematic, um, you'll see you know, there's a USB connector and there's a micro, like the device here. Um, you'll see, for one thing, there's series resistors, which you, will, you may or may not see depending if they're integrated into the micro, uh, but you also may see stuff like a pull-up resistor um, right on the, the USB data line, or you might see it switched. Uh, so these various resistors are how the device communicates to your computer um, what speed it's running at. And there's some other special signaling sequences, but basically that's why uh, you might see that as you look in into the design. Uh, generally, this can be opaque. If you're just using this stuff, you don't care what speed it's at. It's just gonna run at whatever speed it supports, which for the demo I'm talking about is full speed mode. Um, but you might see, you might look at a design and say, why are these resistors here? And that's why. Um, yeah, so if you want more resources, as I mentioned, the USB spec is really good. Uh, USB complete is quite a nice resource. So this is a, a book that's been, I think what's it in the fourth or fifth revision now. Um, and this has almost been the standard for you know years and years. It's sort of one of the best known resources. Uh, it goes through all of the you know use of USB various options in the standard. Um, and now also includes you know the three, the latest version of it, super speed 3.1, which is even faster. Uh, there's an online resource, USB in a nutshell. So this is, uh, goes through a lot of the development of you know, what is USB, how do you use it, and stuff like that. So if you're interested in the, uh, the specifics of USB, you can sort of look, 
you know, one of those two resources or as I mentioned, the standard itself. Um, so I promised at some point that, hey, I would mention USB 3.0. Um, all I'm really gonna do is mention it. If you're not familiar with USB 3.0, uh, it has often this blue connector. The, the interior part of the USB connector will be blue. Um, what it basically does, the trick it does, is it actually has a USB 2.0 pair inside the wire. Um, so you can probably see a connector I cut back there. It, the, the plug looks like a normal USB 2.0 port, but there's actually hidden at the rear some additional contacts. Um, and these contacts are the special USB 3.0 connections. Uh, so if you cut open a USB 3.0 connector or cable, you'll see this in the physical device. So you'll see the USB 2.0 uh, data pair, which is just two wires here. Um, and you'll also see USB 3.0, which uses two wires in each direction, uh, which is these additional wires that have you know, better shielding and stuff like that. So basically this is what, um, USB 3.0 does, and this is how it maintains backwards compatibility. Uh, the nice thing is that, you know, you can use USB 2.0 um, to do your initial development, and if you ever switch to 3.0, it's fairly seamless. On the computer side, the software is very similar, um, and, you know, your device will continue to work with USB 2.0 or 3.0 devices because USB 3.0 has this easy backwards compatibility to 2.0 since the cable is literally just there. All right, so if you wanted to use, uh, you know, USB in your design, uh, the most common thing is this. This is a, uh, FTDI makes this device, and there's a few others, not just FTDI. Um, basically, it gives you USB on one side, or let's call this the FT232. Um, so you have a USB connection on one side, and on the other side, you have a serial port. So from your microcontroller, you can send serial data to this device, um, and on the computer, you can receive it. So this is not bad. Like, if you want to do printfs, this is perfect. This is exactly what you want. Um, but if you want to, you know, you, you want to download data, you want to be able to send firmware upgrades to your device, it's starting to get a little crazy because now you have to make your own protocol on top of the serial layer um, to say, you know, I'm receiving a stream of data. How am I going to deal with it? Uh, on the computer side, you've also got to have all of the serial interface code because once you get to the computer, it turns back into a serial port. Uh, it gets a little sloppy, basically, is that as you start to do this, it becomes almost too complicated. Uh, people still do it because dealing with the serial port is very well known. It's been very well known for a long time. Um, so there's lots of example code. There's lots of legacy stuff out there, microcontroller examples for using a serial port. Uh, you can get a little better. FTDI makes other, other devices that uh, rather than just being a serial port, uh, it has more complicated protocol supported. So you can use SPI or I2C uh, or even like parallel. So you can have you know eight data bits coming out at once going to your AVR. Um, so it's a little better in that you don't have to deal with all of this um, serial interface code on both sides. Uh, you still have what I call a stream-oriented protocol. So you send one byte to the device, the device gets it, receives it, you get another byte, etc. Um, so on, your, on both sides, you've got to deal with that stream. You've got to say, you know, if I want to send it a command, I've got to put a token in front that says, hey, I'm about to send you a command, send the command, say it's done. Um, because it always has to know, you know, I just got a random byte in. I don't know what that byte's supposed to be doing, so I've got to have some state uh, for what, what's happening. And this is where you have this sort of the stream-oriented uh, protocol is needed. So what's more fun is, um, you know, if you're not just doing this, you're not just slinging, streaming data back and forth, uh, if you actually use a USB microcontroller, you could do stuff, you know, uh, you could have a, a mass storage interface, so your device could appear as if it's a USB flash drive, and they could just copy off readings from it. So you could write, um, write log data to a file on your device. On the computer side, you just copy it off. You don't need a special program. Uh, you could become an Ethernet adapter, so if you're doing something and you want you know, a web server on your device, and you want the user 
to be able to open that web server to configure the device, get data. Um, you could do that over the USB. They have an Ethernet adapter protocol. Uh, finally, you could enumerate as a proprietary interface. So this means you're coming up as a completely, you know, your own standard, so to speak. But you can send data really, really quickly. Uh, and you can switch between some of these options even. So you could send data really, really quickly uh, while still having the mass storage interface so they can copy data off the device. You know, if it's just, oh, I want to get some log data, something like that. Um, so that's the sort of stuff you could look forward to with USB that with just these chips aren't possible and you would need a lot of support code on the computer that you would have to custom write just to do this. Whereas all this stuff, the computer is almost giving it to you for free. Some of you know the proprietary interface, sure, you'll need a little bit of code, but as I'll show you, um, it's not actually that much. So there's sort of a... Uh, to get the downside of this custom interface, there's a few issues. Um, one is that uh, USB requires you to use something what's called a vendor ID. So when you plug in a device, the device has this special number, this 16-bit number, uh, that a, what's known as the USB implementers form, IF, um, assigns every company who buys one. And the idea is that they, no two companies can ever have the same product ID or it ruins the whole system. Because you need to know when you plug in a device, who made it, um, and what is that device. So how they solve that is that they force companies to use this vendor ID, um, and every company can then decide, okay, well, we now have 16 bits and we just assign, you know, our first product is product ID one and two and three, or they might try to give it creative. 16-bit um, numbers or something like that, but it's up to the company. Um, to do that, technically, you need to purchase it from the USB implementers form, which is about $4,000 to join US dollars. So if, if this is something you were doing commercially, um, probably not as big a deal. If you're doing this you know, on your own, you probably don't want to spend $4,000 on that. So people tried to get a lot of uh, a lot of workarounds to this because they said, well, hey, what we could do is one company is going to buy the, the vendor ID and sell it to everyone else. Uh, basically, all of those are disallowed. You cannot sublicense it. You can't do anything like that. Um, so to get this to work, you know, if you really want to do this, there's basically a few options. Um, yeah, if you really want to do this, you need that legitimate vid if you want your device to plug in and download drivers from Windows Update. So when it says, hey, I don't know what this device is um, because it will have to be registered. And you'll also have to do some other stuff. Or if you want to use the USB logo you know, on your packaging, it's a, it's a trademark logo, so you need to join USB IF. You have to pay that money. Again, all of this is really targeted at if you're making a, a product. Um, these are probably things that are well worth the, the $4,000 fee. Um, Potentially, so manufacturers like Atmel uh, have their own vendor ID and potentially with permission, they would let you use that with your own you know, product ID. They're gonna say, use this number. Uh, in reality, all of this is very limited, so it may or may not happen. As workarounds to that, there's, um, there's various what I call pirate vendor IDs. Um, so a few of them have been re revoked for example, so a company bought a vendor ID uh, and tried to start selling product IDs. Uh, the USB implementer swarm revoked it, so people now just use that one freely. Uh, so there's a few numbers that a large group of people just started using without actually owning it. Um, you know, all of these are illegit solutions because you can't use the logo, um, nor could you get into Windows Update or anything like that, but for hobbyists, they sort of don't care about any of that aspect, so they've just used these, these numbers. Uh, I have no idea what the law would be on all this, but it's sort of, if you run into the issue that you need, hey, at some point we'll need a vendor ID, um, that's the illegitimate solution that people have come up with. All right, so that's sort of very briefly the two options. So it's the second one I'm gonna be talking about. And the real difference is, um, is that it is a little more development effort. Um, you do need, you have this issue of you need to find a vendor ID, uh, and depending what you're doing, you might need to do driver development. So that's the other thing I'll sort of very briefly mention. 
Um, compared to the off-the-shelf unit, the USB serial, there's very little development effort. Like you just solder the chip down. You know, there's no development. Um, in terms of the, the firmware, uh, you don't have this issue of the vid. Uh, and it's pretty easy for the users to install. But the main downside is these more limited functions. We're just sending data. Um, so I don't, well, I'll mention this briefly. So if you were to do this, you can basically select a whole bunch of different microcontrollers. So Atmel makes some of them. That's what I'm using here. That's what you've used in your presentations. Um, a lot of them are very, very low cost, but they have all sorts of features like do you need high speed? Um, some of them don't even need crystals to operate, so it's just a chip soldered to a board is all you need. Uh, you know, if, if you chuck microcontroller USB into DigiKey, um, there's close to, you know, 10, I think it's 9,000 to 10,000 results. So all the major manufacturers make them. Uh, so what I'm using for this presentation is the Atmel SAM D11. So this is an ARM-based device. So it's a larger device than the AVR you're using. Uh, somewhat similar in terms of the development environment. It uses the same Atmel Studio development environment. And it's worth pointing out there is, um, there's this device, 1890 USB key, that's sort of a low cost uh, Atmel USB device. Atmel has a bunch of these low cost USB development boards. So I think they range sort of, you know, $15 to $50 type thing. I don't know exactly um, to get a development board. So the SAMD 11 device here, you can look through, you know, features of the USB um, supports so full speed, that 12 megabits per second, and the low speed, the 1.5. Uh, it talks about, I mentioned before about the, the pull up and pull down resistors. So it has built in pull up and pull downs. So you don't have to deal with, you know, oh, if you want to be in low or high speed mode. Um, and it has, you know, supports for, uh, running without a crystal oscillator uh, and they'll almost always tell you if you remember I said you know we we have a certain number of endpoints which is where we sling data um, and it has eight input endpoints to get data from the computer and eight outputs to send data to the computer so this is fairly typical of a lot of devices you know this integrated resistors to avoid external parts um, they have what's called ping pong buffers. So the idea is here that we have uh, two buffers and how the system works is we have USB data coming in and it's going to fill this one buffer first. So we'll say, you know, take 32 bytes of data and rate that in. Uh, it's now gonna take me a few minutes to use that data so what happens is that, or not a few minutes, but you know, a few microseconds or milliseconds. Um, so it switches, it starts writing data into another buffer. At the same time it's doing that, the microcontroller can come along and start to empty this buffer. So it's you know, gonna start deleting data from it, um, such that by the time, hopefully, the other buffer is full, uh, it switches back and starts filling up the other. So this is what we call ping pong, because it ping pongs back and forth between the two, um, the two buffers. So you might have multiple of those, so they may not just be two buffers, there might be three or four or eight. Uh, and it's doing the same idea, it's filling one buffer and then the next one, the next one, the next one. So the microcontroller can come along and start emptying them uh, with a little more time. That number of endpoints uh, thing is not often a big issue, although if you start wanting to combine a whole bunch of features, you may run into issues. Um, so for example, I might have something, Rindus is this Ethernet, so I might have a device that, hey, I want it to appear as a, uh, an Ethernet device on the computer, uh, I want CDC serial, so this is for debug, and maybe I want mass storage, and this is for, you know, drivers or documentation. Um, so to add all of those features into one single device, you can just add up, we need uh, three endpoints for that, we need three for this, and two for mass storage, um, so we need eight endpoints plus, you always need the control one that's not on this table. Um, so what this would mean is that if we looked back at this guy, we might say, oh, actually we potentially, um, we may or may not be able to actually implement that depending how these uh, in and out endpoints are spread out among the device. 
So you can run out of endpoints if you start, you know, combining a whole bunch of devices. Um, yeah, so this is something I was doing where, as an example, I have a, uh, an Atmel SAM3, so this is doing high speed uh, USB, so that's doing stuff like a serial port, programming interfaces, and high speed data transfer. Um, this is all done over one, basically one USB interface itself. I don't have a whole bunch crammed in. Um, so you don't always need to use the different types of interfaces. You might be able to get away with just one and on the computer demultiplexing. Uh, stuff like that's really good if you're doing work with programmable logic. Uh, you can have the microcontroller. So this other device here is what's known as an FPGA. Uh, it's a little like if you did the digital logic course at DAL, the CPLD, which you know you can design logic to do anything you want. This is just a much, much bigger version of it. So you can design physical hardware. Um, using this type of USB interface allows you to write data to the physical hardware. So if you need to set registers, uh, you know, you want to configure a clock or something like that, it makes it a lot easier to reach into the FPGA and adjust things. All right. Um, so that's sort of the real quick overview of what the USB microcontroller is. The final part is to introduce you to what's called Python. So Python is a uh, programming language. It's scripted. Uh, it's extremely, extremely easy to use. It's a tiny bit. If you've used MATLAB, uh, it's somewhat similar to that. Uh, but it's very, very easy to use. And you know, it, to some degree, lets you write bad code. Because, for example, you don't need semicolons on the end of a, a Python line. If you've written C, you, know, you need semicolons. Uh, but Python just ignores them because it doesn't care. It says like, well, I know you don't need those, but I don't need them either. So I don't, I just, I don't care. I'm not going to make an error out of it. Um, so it's really weird because you can do stuff like that that you shouldn't do. And you'll look back at your code and it's like, oh, what was I doing? Um, but it, it, it ignores it and just works. So it's pretty nice like that. Very basically, Python itself is white space sensitive is the main change from C. So in C, you know, you'd have, a, oops an if statement and you use brackets to uh, differentiate what happens in the if statement. In Python, it naturally just uses, it says, well, you've indated, indented those two statements, therefore, those two, two statements are oops, uh, the result or get executed if A is less than four. Um, you know, otherwise, it's very similar. It has you know, function calls, strings, stuff like that. So it's very similar to any other programming language you might have used, like C. Um, it uses implicit types, more or less, so I, nowhere do I declare this variable. I just set the year equals 2015. I don't declare anywhere the year is an integer. It just creates it and assigns it the value. Um, you can cast stuff, so you can do this implicit. I can say, hey, make this an integer instead of a floating point, or make that a floating point number. Um, if you want, and you, know, you can define strings really easily anywhere like that. Um, Generally, the idea of Python is to try to make stuff as easy as possible. So, for example, I can add strings. So I could put um, this as a statement, and it's just going to concatenate the two strings together. You know, unlike in C, you need a whole other statement and make a new variable to store it. It's just going to say, "Oh, you want a new string? It's just the combination of those two." Um, so, generally, the idea of Python is you just kind of do what you think you should do, and hopefully, it works. That's the whole design goal of Python, is that you don't, you know, you shouldn't explicitly have to say anything. You should just write what seems like it should work, and it should, which often doesn't, but the idea is really nice. And it does uh, guide a lot of the development in a really nice way. Um, and you can do all of this in what's called the Python console, which is handy for doing tests. So uh, when you install Python, you get this thing, and you can just say, I can say test equals one, two, three, and get the type and it returns. So I'm doing this all interactively. Uh, I don't have it set up here in enough time to sort of show it, but this could be done in real time easily. Uh, you know, it has the idea of arrays. It calls them lists. Um, so we can, we can assign something to this, this list value here. So it uses these square brackets for a list. Um, and we can select, you know, a list element like that. Uh, something two, so it's zero indexed, just like C, so you can see that two is indexing here, zero, one, two. 
Um, so again, similar to C in the zero index. And if we assign um, an element a value, so if I say something two is equal to you know eight, uh, it's now updated that original list. So when you're dealing with lists, the only trick is that you are modifying, you know, even though I'm only passing around the name of that list of something, um, I can actually modify the original list, uh, which is, you know, somewhat probably as you would expect it to happen. The only time it gets you in trouble is that if you call a function and you pass a list argument, uh, within that function, you could modify the original list. Uh, it's as if in C, you know, you're using pointers to arrays. You can think of it like that. It's by default not creating all these copies of the object. You know, it doesn't copy the entire list. It just points to the list. Uh, it has other stuff, so it has dictionaries. So you, you can basically index lists based on name. So you can say stuff like, uh, you know, hello equals red two. Uh, and then I could index the list based on red to count how many balls that are red on a table or something like that. So it's very basic. Uh, to combine the two, so this is the final sort of aspect of it, uh, we have something called Pi USB, And this is a, uh, a wrapper around some open source USB libraries. And as an example, I take people through you know, this human interface device. So this is a Atmel development board. Um, it has a full debugger on it, so within Atmel Studio, you can step through code and stuff like that, um, as well as connecting to your device, like as if it's USB, you know, and we can run through, um, switch through this. So they have an example, Atmel has an example of a uh, human interface device. Just keep skipping through this human interface device uh, project. And all this does is, where's the buttons? Allows, it will print what the value of some button is. If I go back, there's a button here. One of these is reset. This is a user button. And so we can detect when you press the button. Very basic, but you know, simple beginning example. Um, so if you were to download that, and then in Python, Skip all this stuff. Uh, we can basically start to talk to USB devices. So here I have a USB device that is this vendor ID. This is Atmel's vendor ID because this is one of their default demos. So I haven't modified it to, to reuse that. Um, and it has the, this I manufacturer. So this is all those USB descriptors I was talking about, Atmel, ASF. Um, so this is just Atmel. You know, they write whatever string they want in here. Um, and they write big generic at once. So that was the string descriptors we're talking about. Um, this is the vendor. So here's the vendor ID, which is that special number. And the product ID is what Atmel assigned this device. Uh, so we can say connect to you know, some specific device. Um, so doing three lines of Python here, uh, connect to this USB device. And then we can do stuff like request data from the device. Um, so you've, you've got to go through and look at the specifics of what the device is looking for. But basically, there's something called a request type. So I can say, hey, tell me about um, what's known as a report. So human interface device uses these reports that just say, hey, a button got pressed or something like that. So I can just request, uh, request it to give me some data, you know, eight bytes of data. And we can do the same thing with, so that was with the control transfer. We can do the same thing with any of the other inputs or outputs. Um, so in this case, I could see like, hey, this device had two uh, a in uh, receiving data from the device and then out sending data to the device. Um, and these are pretty small. So in this example, it's only sending eight bytes at a time. You can adjust this, you know, 64 bytes and pack them together and stuff like that. Um, but as a really simple example, I can say, hey, add some code to the microcontroller to either blink or not blink an LED based on stuff sent from the uh, stuff sent from the computer. Uh, and once we do that, we can just use this like device.write command. So really easily, dev.write, um, all it's doing is saying, hey, write to this endpoint address here, so this output endpoint, 
this block of data. Um, you know, there's no serial configuration. I didn't have to worry about the baud rate or how I'm going to know the data. The device simply says, hey, here's your next uh, chunk of eight bytes of data. Um, you know, it started right here. So I know what the first byte is and this is the next, you know, the next bytes. Um, so we can do that to change, send different data to the device and you'll see the LED turn or off, on or off. Uh, same thing when you press the switch, it's going to send an input report. Um, and so we can just read this in the Python code. So in this case, it has some other stuff to uh, loop and you know, do a timeout if no data is sent after a while. Um, and what you'll see is as you press the button, the data coming back will change slightly. So that's kind of all there is. The rest of this goes through. You can use Python to really quickly lay out a GUI. Um, with you know a few lines of code, so we can do the same thing except have it that it's telling us if the LED turn it on or off, um, as well as reading the state of the button if it's pressed or released. So that's it. So that's kind of a super super brief overview to um, how you might use a USB microcontroller uh, in your own system to send and receive data. You can speed this up using um, what's known as vendor specific bulk transfer. So Atmel Studio has some demos of this um, as well as in, I have a project with a bunch of source code for this. So if you're interested in it, it is something that you can do. Uh, so I'll skip this stuff because that's gonna be way over time. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the See if there's other stuff of interest. Yeah, some of the, if you do this, there's some tricks in USB. You can only draw so much current from the, uh, from the port at once. And you're supposed to, when you turn your computer to sleep, your device is supposed to turn itself off. So, you know, these, these are actually illegit. There's like USB connected fans and things like that. Uh, because what you should be doing is in your device, you should have logic that turns off all the high power current draws. Um, and you basically need this when you plug the device in. You also have to have logic to say uh, the device needs to start up slowly. So in this case, I'm turning on some of the microcontroller logic and then later on, oops, uh, turning on you know, additional higher current draws. So you can't just have everything come on at once when you plug it in. But yeah, that's kind of it. Any other questions on USB stuff. Sorry, that's sort of an eclectic random introduction, but I thought it might be interesting because as you are going to be doing senior year projects, this is something um, that always impresses people is how easily you can get uh, USB communications up and running and you don't you know, need to use the cheater USB to serial interface and have some pokey program on your computer communicating with it over the, uh, the fake serial port. So questions on that? No? Okay, so that's kind of it.